what is it like to be a child in India. For some, it is wonderful. For others, it is miserable, unacceptable. As a Dalit child, I remember sitting in a school and identified as a Dalit child, isolated, separated, asked to sit outside of the classroom because I was a Dalit. And I remember those days when I was lifting my hands up to ask a question to my upper caste teacher, he would not answer me, he would not look at me, instead he will just totally ignore me. That's the sad, bitter memories I have of a child myself being a Dalit in the schools. Dalit children in India are not educated for centuries thanks to caste system which is playing havoc in the nation of India even today. In the year 2000, around 800 top Dalit leaders of our country came together with a plea, please educate our children. Modern India is full of achievements, of which its government and people are justly proud. Shining India has been to the moon and is off to Mars. Back on Earth, it's wealthy too, with 122 billionaires expected to rise to 225 by 2022. But there's another India, a sort of shadow side, largely unseen by the rest of the world, or indeed by many of India's wealthier 1.2 billion citizens. It's more than the familiar scenes of poverty. It's a world of darkness, where in addition to extreme deprivation, lurks persecution and oppression on a huge scale. In this, the other India, far from the gaze of Western democracies, the Dalits, along with India's other destitute and oppressed peoples, all 300 million of them, struggle to survive. Condemned to poverty, starved of opportunity, harassed and subject to daily cruelty, this is the world of India's forgotten children. Most societies, at least in the South Asian countries and India per se, we've grown up with this, that children are nice, children need to be fed, children must be given this and that, but we also have huge gaps. We have gaps of gender and we have gaps of caste, and now we have the gap of poverty, which transcends and transmutes itself within the caste and the gender. And that is why it is important for us to advocate and advocacy at various levels, beginning with children themselves, understanding that they have rights and they must know what their rights are, with the families, the parents, understanding that these are rights that children must enjoy. There are these mindsets that if I bring a girl child into this world, I will have to look after her dowry, I will have to take care of her till she grows up and is married off. With this, of course, we have a lot of other issues where children are being married off very young ages. Over and above that, we have issues now of children and women being trafficked. Both of them are being trafficked for labor, sometimes for organ trade, but a large number of them are trafficked for commercial sexual exploitation. And it's very easy for people to blame the government, politicians, industrialists, whoever it may be, to say that, Oh, you see, they were born in poor families. Oh, they were born in so-and-so caste. Oh, they've been they're born in uh, cities and towns and districts and states of India, which is not so developed. If India can go and reach the moon, it doesn't want to reach its father of districts. How far could that be? <laughs> I live with my, my father and mother. There are two brothers and sister living with me. And uh, we live together in this home. My family background is very, very poor. I have to work in this mill for earn something for, money, for our family. Amit's father cannot work, so Amit, who is 14, has to provide for his family and has been working here in the rice mill since he was a small boy. India has laws against child labour, but they are largely ignored. Amit works four to six hours daily before and after school. He has no choice, 
as in bonded labour, he repays loans his parents have taken at extortionate rates of interest. Amit says he hates the fumes and dust, which choke his lungs and gives him chest pains. Long term, it may well destroy his health, but his family are very poor and without adequate welfare. What can he do? I remember when I was a child, I was playing uh, cricket with some of my friends. Uh, it is there as vivid memory in my mind. I accidentally bumped into an upper caste boy. He was a Brahmin boy. You know, the caste system, four layers. So this boy was from the upper caste, the first caste. I accidentally bumped into him. He became so furious and he yelled at me saying, you dirty Dalit dog. That's what he said. And I became so upset and I, angry and I had this cricket bat in my hand, took him and gave him a whack. <laughs> he was hurt, he was bleeding. There was a big commotion in the village because the news spread fast and wide saying a Dalit boy beat up an upper caste boy. And uh, all his relatives gathered in the village. It was just talk of the whole village there. And they held me guilty of this crime of beating up an upper caste boy as a Dalit. And they gave me a punishment. They said, we have to leave the village at once. They said, in next 24 hours, we have to relocate the village. That left a very deep hurt wound in my heart as a Dalit. I was hardly 11, 12 years old boy. And that was the time I started asking this question, why did God create me as a Dalit? No answer. And I believe even today, many of our Dalit children are asking the same question. Why am I Dalit? Why I am I untouchable? Why I, I am not treated as human beings as others? Why there is no value and worth for me as a Dalit child? That's why I, I feel it is timely, it is relevant, it is absolutely necessary to think of this forgotten children of India. The problems faced by the Dalits are profound. They go back centuries and are experienced from the cradle to the grave. It is astonishing today that across India such people should be considered outcasts, untouchable, a source of pollution, subhuman. The goading of Dalit children, and worse, by upper caste boys, is not just playground antics. It embodies the worst kind of prejudice and apartheid. To expel a whole family from their village is catastrophic, with huge social implications. But such village atrocities happen every day. In a recent case where a Dalit's dog had mated with the dog of an upper caste, the outraged, polluted upper caste family had the Dalit's home burned to the ground. In India, every 18 minutes, a crime is committed against a Dalit. Every day, three Dalit women are raped, two Dalits are murdered, and two Dalits' houses are burnt. Crimes against Dalits are significantly unreported. Part of the reason is that Dalits often get rough justice from the police because they are untouchable, and in 27% of villages, Dalits have been prevented from entering police stations at all. In India, almost half the population are unknown to the state. That's because 46% of all births in India, mainly Dalits, remain unregistered. This affects civil, political and welfare rights. It prevents the protection of Dalit children from sexual exploitation, trafficking, forced and early marriages and child labour. In 2008, when Sumit, seen here, was 11, his family was the victim of a first-degree crime. As a result, with no compensation or welfare support, he's been forced into child labour to work the fields and be the main breadwinner for himself and his family, his mother and grandmother. My name is Sumit. I live in a village called Jiya Kapurava. It is situated nearby Udhavli Barabanki in the district of Uttar Pradesh. My mother's name is Miss Anju Rawat. My father's name was Radhelal Rawat. I don't have any brothers and sisters. I am alone. And I was eight years when my father left me, and I have to do for, I have, I have to do agricultural work for my, for as the income of my home. I am the only source of my, in, my income of my home. I live with my mother and my grandmother, 
and uh, they help us. Can you tell me what happened to your father? He was having some money, and uh, the people he gave some money. He lent some people money, and uh, he asked him to give ma return money. But uh, the people they don't want to return money, so they killed him. He was murdered. Yes. And how is it now for your family? Because that happened in 2008. Eight. Still very hard for you. So I was small, and uh, it was happened in 2008. Now. My family background is very low. I I cannot afford too much things. I am the only income of income source of my family, so I have to do some work, and uh, hardly we can manage our family. Tell me about the work on the fields. We have to cultivate our field, plow it. After that, sow the fields and take out the weeds from the field. After that, we have to ripe. When it is ripe, we have to cut it and bring to the home. So, do you work on the field every day? Yes, approximately one hour. And when the season is there, then we have to work for whole day. Either it is night also too. How is it working on the field when it's so hot? We have to wear the sun and the cold, uh, warm airs, the the hunger in the stomach. Of course. Yes. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you, sir. We are in one of uh, the active quarry areas in Bangalore around. And uh, here, some nearly one lakh people, one hundred thousand people work uh, over here in this area, and mainly people coming from adjoining states, Tamil Nadu, and um, Andhra Pradesh, and also locals, uh, people from Karnataka also they do work here, and uh, most of the days, you know, in a, in a week, uh, six days they do work, and this, on Sunday it is free, uh, they have no work, and uh, they are paid twice in a month which means uh, once in two weeks they get payment and in between if they need any money uh, more than what uh, they are uh, earned uh, they go to the owners and uh, they ask for more money and uh, but finally they end up in in debts because they don't uh, uh, they are not able to pay it back and it carries on and then it almost becomes like a slaves to the owners and they cannot go anywhere else and they have to be there uh, working always uh, with a very, very uh, cheap um, uh, salary or wages for them. The reason we refer to forgotten children is mainly because India is a very young country. One of the statistics is that more than 75% of India's population is under the age of 35. But in this sheer numbers of young people, you have the children of the 250 million Dalits who are in that number. And then you have the children of the 500 million low castes who are within that number, which in fact means that the majority of youth in this country either are from the Dalit or from the low caste. And therefore, as India emerges, these children are forgotten. Forgotten in terms of access to quality education like everybody else who is privileged, English medium with the vernacular, access to health care, access to economic empowerment, access to protection against the laws. Their plight has been called by various commentators as nothing less than national shame. Can you tell me what it's like for a young girl to grow up in India today? One thing uh, a child growing up in India, and a young, particularly a girl growing up in India would face, uh, is a lot of uh, discrimination based on her gender. The majority of girls uh, are socialized to be in the domestic sphere and provide domestic services for their families. We say that girls face problems from womb to the tomb. And now I think we can get, go a little further and say they face problems even in the womb because it's common knowledge now that there's a vast amount of girls uh, who are killed before birth. Women are always considered economic burden to the family, except in certain communities where there is uh, a, a greater sense of equality uh, and access to equal um, opportunity. 
and uh, so therefore there is a uh, in and society itself there is this feeling that girls are second class soci- uh, citizens in the country therefore their access to education to health services uh, to having their uh, personal social sec- psychological needs met uh, these are always second priority and uh, uh, boys and men in families are uh, considered to have first call on all resources belonging to the family even if those resources are earned or generated by women this is a bro- in a broad sense the real the reality of the common indian home and in that context there is a lot of structured violence that happens a lot of uh, exclusion and discrimination that girls face even violence severe violence uh, physical violence mental violence restriction of freedom a lack of choice in terms of marriage um, profession uh, education employment in all spheres there is a lot uh, there is a lot of denial of agency to the girl poor parenting is of course a significant factor in a child's development and psychological health where also there is extreme poverty dearth of opportunity and complex social factors which exist in abundance in indian society problems for growing children are magnified immensely india's home affairs ministry reports that given such pressures on average 8 children under 14 commit suicide every day one such who miraculously survived her own serious attempt to take her life is mariam now age 16 we'll see mariam in a moment but we have had to obscure her face as recently there have been several attempts to kill her indeed just the day before this interview there was an attempt to abduct her from the hostel where she sought refuge mariam's mother was a bar dancer who routinely slept with her clients and from where mariam was only 4 regularly brought them back home to share the bed which she in turn shared with her daughter this had always troubled mariam but particularly so when more recently one of the clients became more regular and sought to marry her mother sharing their bed this man started to abuse the young mariam a further complicating factor is that around this time mariam discovered she had acquired hiv aids from her mother which swiftly shattered her dreams of marriage and parenthood distressed and confused by all this mariam attempted suicide by lying on the railway tracks in the event not being of great size the oncoming train passed over her but severed her lower leg in the process rescued by a passerby she was taken to hospital and despite profuse bleeding and devastating damage her life was in fact saved but there was worse to come on 5th october that isha my friend she called me up and she told me on 2nd october your mom committed a suicide and why because uh, vijay he left her he had left her he didn't want to marry her anymore so he left her and because that she committed suicide in the kitchen in a house she hung herself to the fan then from there i came to see my mom mom's body before i come but uh, my family members had burnt it they burnt everything they open my cup uh, in my house there was a cupboard they opened it did you and leave a toothpaste took all my mom's clothes took money whatever they can they ha- in my cupboard they had everything they took and went but afterwards i was but i was in a shock that my mom is not there anymore so i didn't care so much this t- started telling me uh, this i forcing me that uh, write all full property on our name so i don't know i don't want i don't want to do because uh, my mom she worked so hard you know i'm not going to i'll not use it i'll make some nice uh, orphanage because she had a dream to make an orphanage i'll make for her that then they told no uh, put it on our name we'll take care of it because you're minor huh? they'll anyone will kill you and they'll take money from you so don't don't put it on our name i don't know then once my whole family member came to kill me so i ran to police station not ran actually i took a auto and i ran over there and i told the police station in that police station everything what had happened 
so they told okay we'll uh, take a written note from your family members it'll not come in your way any time so they took a note and because i'm a minor they put me to cwc child welfare community in my opinion the oppression of women and children worldwide is the paramount model challenge of the present era India, with one third of its population below the age of 18, it's also known as a young country. You know, sadly, India is also the home to the most number of child laborers. And also, it has the largest number of sexually abused children. Basically, I think this is because uh, the children's voices can be easily silenced. Their nimble fingers can be forced to work from dusk to dawn for a pittance, and they are the invisibles. And they just disappear without even causing a ripple. And uh, hence, they also become easy prey for the targeters. They are forced into sexual exploitation and bonded labor. And all it takes is a little help for them to be freed from such an evil with the little help that we've offered to get them back on their feet and get them back into school. We have over 50 billionaires in our country, and yet we have 17 million child laborers. India is also home to 3 million children living out there in the streets. In the face of such a grim picture, the only solution, I think, is education. Uh, education is the answer, whatever problem, we are trying to address, be it health care, poverty, unemployment, or human rights. I think education is a part of the huge solution. This is Deepsi, a bright, always cheerful girl, just 13 years old. But don't be fooled. To see Deepsi now, excelling at school, clearly enjoying her studies and many friends, wonderfully supported by those who now care for her, you would never realize the suffering and abuse she's experienced in her young life. Sadly, in Dalit communities, it is typical of the way men see women as objects and so often will dominate, oppress and abuse young girls, consigning them to a life of misery. When Deepti was just 10 years old, her father had forced her mother to take out a large loan in her own name. He then ran off with the money, leaving Deepti's mother unable to repay to face the consequences with the loan sharks. Their threats were so distressing, it drove Deepti's mother to drink acid in an attempt to kill herself. Fortunately, she didn't succeed, though the acid badly damaged her internally. During this time of deep distress for her mother's well-being, Deepti's father and uncle began to abuse her and this appalling behaviour escalated as others joined what can only be called a form of serial gang rape. Deep Tea herself takes up the story. Uh, when I was with my parents, with my father, uncle, my uncle used to go for work and his, his friends, means his all the partners used to come to house and they used to drink and uh, so, like five members came to house, including my uncle and my father, it was seven members. The seven members tried to abuse me and I was like a fish out of a water. I don't know what to do. I, I felt like so awkward that, that time. I don't know what to do, even nobody is there to stay. I can't go, to, I can't step my leg out of the house. Wherever they send me to work, only that house. Even if I say them, they won't believe, they'll beat me harshly. And I don't know what to do, where to go. Even I thought to hang myself on the tree, but I felt scared. If I won't die, means anything problem is I can't survive without any parts of my body. So I just left it even. Then I don't know what to do. Then my father used to beat me. They used to give me electric shock, and they used to beat me in the rod, and they used to scold, scold me badly, and they used to send me to work. And once they told me, you want to pick the rap, but I said I can't do it because I'm not from that background even I don't do and he slapped me and how much if you beat me beat me so I'll be like my father my father my father but when I came to know that he's so bad he's is uh, giving us trouble to marry other girl. When I ask him directly why you are giving this much trouble to me, he said, I don't want you people, I want to kill you and marry a rich girl and I want to have lots of money with me. So when I came to know about the real 
face of him then i stopped talking to him then i don't know where to go then so i started crying i even i used to not pray for god because when this much problem happened nobody came and helped me even my own friends they left me they said you go i don't want to talk to you and all they said so i can't go to school even then i was struggling so badly and uh, day they used to not give me food like once a day it's night only a morning and afternoon i should go for work and night i'll come at 9 o'clock then only i'll have my dinner after having dinner even i should clean the house and i should wash the clothes so i should sleep at 11:30 like 12 o'clock around and what age were you at, at this time i was like, i was even 10 years only i just want to ask you about the circumstances of your home where where you live and no. uh, now mm-hmm. and, and what that's like for you my mother was married to st- another boy i was so happy to see him, my new father but when i came to know about he one him he also tried to abuse me but i was not having that much conscious that he is good with me so i told my mother i don't want to be here i want to leave you and all so i can't stay with my home even if i go home now i'll be very scared to stay in my home because even my second father is not good he also tried to abuse me so i came to know that world and i started crying even my mother said uh, you should adjust and go you should adjust so i said i don't want to stay i never come to home i want to be in a hostel only so even in holidays if i go home also i'll be very careful and i never come back i never go again home i think so you have the issue of children who are being kidnapped smuggled sold into commercial sexual exploitation free labor and sometimes for organ trade and that is human trafficking and in this human trafficking you look at the economics of it being so lucrative when a child is stolen a child is smuggled a child is kidnapped you can sell this child 12 to 14 times and this commodity this child or this woman is a commodity that does not become simply second hand it becomes 14th and 15th hand before this child or woman is sold into the small brothels and red light areas in our country children as young as 4 5 6 years old not only for commercial sexual exploitation in brothels but also into massage parlors into making various kinds of films blue film green film red film gray films you name the rainbow of films that are there and all of it is money it's no longer a social evil and i abhor this phrase called social evil that most people seem to be using it because as long as they say it is a social evil the politics and the economics of it is kept outside it is a political and economical crime it's a violation of human rights not social evil anymore because saying that just absolves me or i pretend to be absolved of my responsibility to this to be trafficked as a child is not only devastating the damage like a flood inevitably tears into adult life so what are the long term implications for a child trafficked in this way to grow up with a life of continuing exploitation and abuse Well, this is Nayati's story. In her own words, Nayati gives us a whole life picture of an abused child become an abused woman. India has many forms of trafficking. This is a story of what happens to a child in a whole life of forced prostitution. My name is Nayati. My parents had one son, and after his birth they miscarried two children. They were very superstitious and in my village there was a jogini who claimed she was a goddess and who prophesied that what would happen to people usually bad things and my parents took serious note of what she said One day the jogini told my parents that if they were to have a boy child the family could keep him but if they gave birth to a girl then they must dedicate the girl to the goddess and she in her turn would become a jogini if they don't do this bad luck would come upon the family When I was 9 years old I was dedicated to the goddess and as a jogini it meant I was owned by the men of the village I would no longer belong to my parents anybody could sleep with me and do what they wished with me which is what happened and still happens to this day 
When I was 14, the man who was responsible for me becoming a Jogini claimed his right to marry me. He already had two sons and was rich and owns land. But all he wanted of me was to be a slave to him and his family. Apart from abusing and demeaning me, still as a Jogini, anyone could sleep with me. I was a sex slave as well as a house slave. So over time, I had 12 children. I have no idea who their fathers are, but from various diseases, seven of my children have died. Of the five who remain, two of them, a girl and a boy, are blind. One girl is paralyzed, and it is just the two boys who are working, laboring and driving an auto rickshaw. They are very poor, as I am. My husband never helps them out, neither has he ever given any money to me. He could do easily, but he always refused to pay for anything, including medicine, which is how my seven children died. Yet, despite his wealth, I still have to pay for food for him and his children. And to do that, I have to work as a coolie, as a laborer too. I am lucky if I get 40 rupees a day. I feel strongly that no one should become a jogini, not in our world today, it's a life of exploitation, poverty, and sheer misery. But there's still so much superstition around, and many young girls are still being dedicated. There's been a government law since 1988 designed to prevent this happening, but not one case has been brought under it. And still it goes on and on. The government says there are hardly any Joganese left, but there's been a survey recently that shows there are 2,200,000 in Andhra Pradesh alone. It's a terrible life. I can't describe how bad it is. I want to tell our government to stop it altogether, but they've not done anything yet. I'll be surprised if they do. I am David Rajkumar. We are right now in the, in the middle of the slum, and uh, this is uh, the slum which is called Roshanagar Indirapuram, Modi Road, right in Bangalore city. And uh, this slum contains somewhere 50 to 70,000 people. And uh, each family has got the average of uh, 8 to 10 members in the family, somewhere uh, 6 to 8 children. And uh, the problems in this area is uh, health is number one problem. And no water facilities and no shelter uh, facilities given in this area. And uh, people are living in a very, very pathetic condition over here. And the children are deprived of uh, health, education, and uh, love, and uh, the proper way of growing like any other children in uh, uh, well-to-do families, and uh, this is a problem here. Men, they waste away at the end of the day. Uh, many of them, they drink and uh, gambling and all is there, and that's how women, they work on making incense sticks. Uh, maybe in a day, if they make uh, some 2,000 sticks, they might get somewhere uh, 30 to 35 rupees, that is, which is uh, uh, less than half a pound, and that is the condition over here. And most children here, um, most families, they have a meal a day, uh, which means children they have at night probably a meal, and then remaining one they eat in the morning, and then uh, they have to wait till uh, their mothers come and cook again. And this is the situation over here. Child labor is a, again a heinous crime which is very unique to our country I would say. Then thanks again to caste system which says that because you are Dalit you are doomed to only do certain jobs. For instance manual scavenging. It breaks my heart as I see on a daily basis in the streets of India today where a particular group of people called manual scavengers are involved in cleaning the human excrement in their bare hands. And I cannot think of any other profession in the entire globe which is so demeaning as this. And I have declared war against this crime. And I want to fight out for these children who are so-called manual scavengers, who are involved, instead of going to schools, they are involved in cleaning the toilets. They are involved in sweeping the roads. And this breaks my heart. And this is India for you.
कितना करना है तीस 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 थर्टी कैसा लगता है काम करने से अब कैसा होना लागे लेकिन पेट भरे खाते करते हैं बाद में कैसा ना लागे ला कैसा लगा उसे बोला खराब लगे ला अच्छा अब खराब तो लगते बाल लेकिन फिर भी करें कि पढ़ाता इंसान के मजबूरी ऐसा चीज होला the employment of manual scavengers was banned in 1993, but many homes, local authorities and the Indian Railway continue this disgusting and health-harming practice. Manual scavenging is so life-threatening, scavengers rarely live beyond 30 years. Even though, as we've seen, scavengers now cover the human feces and the rags used for menstruation with ash, the health risks are as great as they ever were. It's a problem of caste. If you're born into a scavenging family, for the majority, there's no way out. This is not the India which the world is known because they think India is shining. They are talking about economically booming India, the IT exploding India. But I'm talking about another India, a different India, which is not known hitherto to the outside world. And there you see the streets of India, you will see what caste system has done to this country. You will see what happened to these children who could have been studying in schools, but their childhood is snatched away. Their dignity is stolen. And it broke my heart the other day as I was reading a statistic which says that there are 200,000 child prostitutes just in the city of Mumbai, red light district. That breaks my heart. And I was reading another statistics, I almost cried when I read. It says, by 2025, by the year 2025, one out of five Dalit children will be a child prostitute. And I cannot digest this fact. Most people see India as a very prosperous country, a country that's developing and proposed to be the next superpower in the world today. Very few people know that today in India we have more starving children than they are in sub-Saharan Africa. Children starving because of chronic malnutrition, chronic energy deficit, because they don't have access to food, 
often when there is food available elsewhere in the country and it's just not distributed equally. This unequal system in our country is what predisposes the Dalit people and the Dalit children to a whole battery of illnesses that are largely preventable and basic primary health care can protect them. Caste system was introduced to us by a group called Aryans who invaded India 3,000 years ago. And they are the one who introduced the caste system to this country. And it exists till date. And it says, because you are born in a particular caste, you are an untouchable. You are an unborn, and it is better that you are not born. They are the most vulnerable children, the Dalits. They mostly come from dysfunctional families. They are looking for opportunities to get away because of the poverty that they live in, because they are abused. And I think the Dalit children are always looking for opportunities to better their lives because they are always segregated, always oppressed. Any chance they get and any small promise that's made for a better life, they just go for it. And so they are totally unaware when false promises are made to them. So they are easy targets for the traffickers. Uh, we really believe that the stakeholders of, of trafficking are multiple, that there are many layers and it's a very well-organized industry and not something ad hoc. Uh, when you identify the pathways that are happening in the country, you realize that it is businessmen who have contacts within the government, contacts at high levels, influential people who are involved as well because it's such a lucrative business. As India's economy is doing better and as our middle class buying capacity is doing better, so is the demand for sex work and sex workers. And because of that, there's a driving force that drives women and victims from the villages, from the rural areas who are uneducated, who don't even know there's an issue called trafficking until they themselves find themselves entangled in the system. We have seen a spate of laws being made uh, as far as uh, child protection goes and uh, even for the rights of women. But when it comes to implementation, it is a problem. And not just implementation. They might go with the uh, legal proceedings. What we find difficult to digest is the implementation of laws on time. And I just believe delayed justice is no justice at all. And so we want to see laws being implemented on time. And going one step further, why even go into this? I mean, I think prevention is better than cure. And so, you know, we just have to concentrate and focus more on awareness and education, which will solve this problem big time. The biggest thing that needs to change is uh, the way young men in this country are reared. I think girls have always been disciplined and taught. I work in a full time in an organization that works on the empowerment of women. And um, has it, this group, this organization has existed for over 20 years. I joined about a year ago. Uh, but now I've, my team and I have agreed for the next few years to focus on uh, the gender sensitization of men and boys. And so what we need to see changed is the attitude of men and boys uh, towards girls. Here at Tarika Center, uh, we've seen lives being changed because of the help that we are rendering to women and children. We just go whenever we get news of someone being trafficked or someone being exploited. We work together as a team. We have them rescued. We are privileged to have them over at our center for the rehabilitation part of it. We find ourselves always dealing with very complex, very deeply entrenched attitudes of people regarding women and their status. And uh, that is one thing that I would like to see change. We have vocational training skills being offered to women. We teach them tailoring, computers, spoken English. We also run a beautician's course for them. These are women who come from vulnerable backgrounds and they have been exploited and abused. But even as they come here and gain a skill, they go out with such confidence and then they begin to lead productive lives. Their lives are totally transformed after a period of six months of training at Tarika Center.
We also have accommodation for women and children who are fleeing life-threatening situations. And for them, we also give them skills. And for the children, we send them to schools. Some of our children go to the Good Shepherd schools. They excel when they are given an opportunity. They study in the English medium schools, and that just turns their lives around. And we are absolutely thrilled to see the difference that it's making in their lives. Of the women we've seen in the Taraka Centre, some have been literally rescued from the exploitation and oppression that comes from human trafficking. No official figures exist, but it is estimated that trafficking affects up to 65 million Indians. Forced labour is the largest problem. India's poorest are highly vulnerable to exploitation by loan sharks. And as we've seen, for this they pay dearly in bonded labour, in rice mills, quarries, agriculture, sweatshops, and the like. But lagging only a few steps behind is India's sex trade, which is booming. It's even turning to Bangladesh and Nepal, from where it imports up to 50,000 women and children to boost its commercial sex trade every year. An astonishing 40% of all prostitutes in India are children. And though there is a growing demand for young girls in the industry, increasingly in centres like Mumbai, young boys are being recruited to work as so-called masseurs, a euphemism for male prostitution. What can protect young people from this terrible, life-destroying criminal exploitation? And for Dalit children, clearly the most vulnerable, is there any way of helping them transcend the age-old stranglehold of caste and untouchability? From the Dalit community has come the recognition that short of abolishing caste itself, almost an impossible dream, education is the true key, a way to unlock the oppression of the centuries and to free potentially millions from the dark side of the other shameful India. Most of the children coming to our schools are from Dalit Bhujan community, that is backward and outcast children group and this comprise of 80% of the population. The job depends on the English medium education. So people request us to come to the villages and the neglected places where we can for those children. We have over 24,000 students in our schools and 80% of the children are coming from this community. Many of their parents have no job or smaller jobs and they cannot afford for English medium education. Because the children are going to the school, many are not being taken away to the cities for other small menial jobs and they get vanished, they are not anymore traced. So our schools are giving not only education, primary medical attention and economic development and prevent the children being trafficked to the other cities. The Dalits themselves believe if they want to break caste in the minds of the Dalit people, and the place to begin it is with children who grow up thinking that they are not less than anybody and they are not untouchables. They are equal in value uh, like anybody else and are provided not just a secular curriculum of English education with a government certificate, but their thinking pattern of how they think themselves and the dignity uh, that they have and the self-worth that they have is very critical. And so the education model that they have wanted, uh, centers and schools that affirms this, this. Now, education for our children and for the early children is really prevention from trafficking. If we don't do that, most of them are in for a life of being trafficked and in some kind of exploitative labor. Close to 50% or more of all our children would have ended up as child laborers or as traffic children or sold into the vast slave human market that's in India if they had not come into this kind of English medium education. 
We have now graduated four years of students across the nation and we see the impact of that education on these kids. Earlier they had no dreams, today they have dreams. Earlier they had no hope, today they have a lot of hope. Earlier they wouldn't be able to compete, today they can compete with the best in the land and they don't need any favors from the government. So we are seeing the stark difference. We are also seeing the difference in their communities and in their families, in their villages, where suddenly education center becomes an enormous symbol of the empowerment of the whole community. I want to become a doctor and help to the people, help to the people just like me. Many of the people are like many of the people are in problems like me how i how i am in my childhood like in my childhood my father left her, left us so many of the people are like that so i just want to help them after this i finished school i want to join one college lela college i want to come i want to become a police I want to become a cricket player and I will get a chance. I am trying in the selections. I went to the, I got a many medals and scholarships. I want to become a doctor because in our, in our country there, 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 there are a lot of sick people. There, there is no, not, not much doctors to treat. Yeah. For Dharmic children, it's almost impossible to exaggerate the transformatory power of education. For children who have grown up in extreme poverty, with notions that they are untouchable, without value, that they can be disposed of by any who take exception to them, English medium education in these Good Shepherd schools means the world to them. Thanks to this initiative, despite ongoing caste prejudice, the young people we have just heard can, and most likely will, make the kind of progress they aspire to. A generation ago, it would have been impossible. Today, from the schools we have seen in this film, young people are in fact going on to higher education, and some have already become doctors, teachers, sportsmen and women, police and army personnel, and other roles hitherto denied them. And education is the key. Of course, it's a small beginning, and there's much opposition to it. But India's forgotten children are on the threshold of what could become their most significant breakthrough since the iron grip of caste began many centuries ago. I strongly feel there is hope for the children of India. And I say it because I see already people have taken notice of this heinous crime which is being committed against the children in India. Child prostitutes, child laborers, manual scavengers, and there is a growing awareness. Had you asked this question, say, five years ago, I would have said there is no hope for Dalit children. But today, there is a growing awareness. Thank God for even the projects like the Forgotten Children of India, which exposes the other side of India, which tells the world that there are a group of children who needs to be loved, who needs to be cared for, who needs to be educated, who needs to be told that they have a worth, self-worth, self-dignity. And hence, I am hopeful that things will change in our country. India has no future if India does not address the plight of its children. The very fact that there is hunger among a significant number of children across the nation is unacceptable when our go-downs are full with grain and we are not able to distribute because of the systems that pervade the country. This kind of treatment to children eventually will breed enormous amount of social problems. And disenfranchised children and youth, and disenfranchised youth especially, then become a base for recruiting for those who are communal agents who want to divide the country on the basis of religion. They become recruitment ground for extremists who want to pick up violence to solve their problem. This struggle of our mission to enlighten the government official, the government of India, uh, it's an ongoing battle. And uh, on a daily basis, we make sure that we send this message 
strong, loud and clear to the government of India that there is another India here. There is another group of people who are silently suffering on a daily basis. So our message to the government of India as well is to take notice this heinous crime. Sadly, it's falling in the deaf ears, but we are not going to give up hope. We will continue our struggle till we find justice. And our mission is to find that justice, bring back that smile on the children of India, especially the Dalit children of India. And uh, we hope one day the government of India will take note of it. And that's our hope. I have a very strong message for the people in the West and even for the governments in the West. India, there are two sides of India. There are two Indias, I would say. One India, the economically booming India. The other India, where the caste system is still alive, where the modern slavery is still existing, where this dangerous, diabolic caste system says that these people are not worthy. They are worthless. And hence my message to the Western world, and hence my plea even to the Western government, is to take notice of this modern slavery. Unless there is a concentrated effort, unless there is a united voice, the global voice, this heinous practice which exists in our country for the last 3,000 years, will not be eradicated, will not be addressed. Hence my plea to the West and to the well-wishers and the philanthropists of the world is to take notice of this modern slavery of India today and help our nation to come out of this modern slavery so that there is human dignity maintained and my children, Dalit children, will be freed and recognize they have a worth, they have dignity.